Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Terence Doyle, and uh, tonight I'm going to be uh, speaking on Galen, who I've called the Prince of Physicians. Uh, <clears throat> and um, Galen was a Greek physician who worked and wrote in the second century Rome of Marcus Aurelius, and he was without doubt the most prolific and the most influential writer on uh, medicine and theory in the ancient world. His views were gospel for 1500 years um, until the time of the scientific revolution, if you will, in the 17th century, 1600s. Uh, now these two pictures that I've got here, uh, on the left is one showing Galen uh, doing a public demonstration with a dissection of a monkey that you can see there. Uh, and the other one is a front piece from an early 1500 uh, collection of Galen's works. And usefully we've got a lot of engravings uh, around the margin of this front page. And I'm going to be using these uh, engravings because they give little stories about uh, the things I'm going to be talking about as I go on. Well, Galen was um, born in Pergamon, which is in the kingdom of um, of uh, Pergamon. It's on the uh, western coast of Asia Minor in what is now Turkey. And the city is now called Bergama in Turkish. And it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, when you uh, go all the way down the uh, western coast of Turkey, there are multiple sites of uh, great archaeological interest from Pergamon down to um, Ephesus. And here is the Meander River, which is uh, so called because I suppose it's meandering along the, the central plain of Turkey. Um, so Galen was born in Pergamon and he was the son of a very wealthy and prominent citizen, Elias Nikon, who's an architect. And he was responsible for a good deal of the reconstruction and building of Pergamon, which was flourishing at this time. Uh, he was very keen to have his son uh, get the very best possible education, which in those times involved largely philosophy, but also mathematics and astronomy. Uh, but you'll see that all throughout this talk, I'm going to be emphasizing how much uh, Galen was influenced by his philosophical training, uh, apart from his scientific one. So from the age of 14 to 16, he was uh, taught by the most prominent philosophers of the day in that part of the world. He was trained in Aristotelian, Platonic and Stoic and uh, also Epicurean philosophy. Um, and then at the age of 16, uh, he Galen tells us that his father had a dream which, uh, in which the god of medicine, Asclepius, appeared to his father and told him that his son uh, should be trained as a doctor. And so he um, got Galen uh, in a student position in the local temple of Asclepius, the Asclepion, where he became a therapeutes, which is a kind of an assistant, if you will, or a, a trainee uh, in medicine. And there he was trained by two very prominent uh, and well-known uh, doctors of antiquity, Iscreon and Satyrus. And again, when you uh, travel to um, this part of the world, you can see the um, uh, remains of the Asclepion down here still, and you can wander all around them. It's about two miles away from the main part of the old city, which is up on the hill here, uh, but it's a really interesting place to visit. 
Well, um, after he uh, spent his time uh, in the um, Escapium, um, he then started to travel and he went from Pergamon down uh, about 200 kilometers south to a city called Smyrna, uh, which is now the modern Turkish city of Izmir. And it's another interesting place to visit. It's just above the uh, old and very famous city of Ephesus. You remember uh, the uh, disciple Paul writing uh, rather stroppy letters to the Ephesians in Ephesus. Uh, he also wrote to another group over here called the Galatians of Galatea. Uh, we'll talk about those a wee bit later. But anyway, in Smyrna, he was uh, taught by two other very well-known doctors of antiquity, Pelops and Albinos. He then uh, traveled to Corinth. Actually, I've forgotten to say that um, the reason he was able to do this was that his very wealthy father had died at this point. Uh, and so at the age of 19, he was um, suddenly a very wealthy uh, young man of independent means. And so he start, started to travel to widen his education uh, because he didn't really have to work at that time. So he went, he traveled then to Corinth, uh, where, which was another major medical center, center of learning. And finally, down to Alexandria. Uh, and this is a picture down here of the Great Library of Alexandria. So um, for a long period of antiquity, Alexandria was perhaps one of the foremost uh, centers of learning in the ancient world after Athens. And when Athens declined, Alexandria really took over, had a vast library, uh, but it was also a great center of learning in medicine. Uh, as well as anatomy and the sciences and the arts. It was the place to go if you wanted a general education. So he spent five years in Alexandria. And after that, he then traveled back to his home city of Pergamon. So um, uh, in Pergamon, he was appointed the um, physician and surgeon to the local gladiatorial school. And um, he then started to write. And uh, a lot of his uh, writings uh, tell about the terrible wounds that these gladiators achieved, uh, received. Um, and uh, a lot of his anatomical knowledge uh, and his surgical skill was developed in this very practical way. Um, by this time, uh, when at the age of 28, uh, he'd now been studying medicine for 12 years. And so he was really very well qualified. Um, and he uh, had been trained in the very best medical centers. Uh, so Pergamon at this time was a very dynamic and developing city. It, didn't quite rival Alexandria, but it certainly rivaled Athens. Um, the population was between 100,000 and 150,000 people or so. Um, it um, was being rebuilt um, uh, after a period of decay, I suppose, um, but it had a theater, a forum, an amphitheater, a stadium, uh, Roman baths. It was a Roman colony at this stage. Uh, and temples and aqueducts, and the very large temple of Asclepius, uh, where he was originally trained. This is a drawing of, of, of its reconstruction, but uh, these are some of the remains. And again, uh, when you visit this area, you can wander around the ruins, uh, which are really very spectacular of the old city. Uh, this particular part up here represents uh, this arcade of the, um, uh, the theater. Um, it also had a very large library. Uh, so it was a big academic center as well as anything else. Uh, just as an aside, um, the name parchment or the word parchment derives from the name of uh, Pergamon. Um, the, uh, at the time, Alexandria had um, a monopoly on the most widely used writing material at the time, which was um, parchment, which was um, 
um, not available elsewhere. And so in Pergamon, they developed um, the uh, use of hides, animal hides for writing on. Uh, and this became known as uh, Charta Pergamena, or it was later um, kind of changed into uh, the word parchment. Uh, so <clears throat> having spent uh, three or four years in uh, Pergamon, the kingdom of Pergamon started to uh, go to war with the Galatians who were their neighbors over here. Uh, things became a bit difficult for Galen in Pergamon. And besides, he I think he wanted to spread his wings, so he then went to Rome. This is in 162. So the Rome that he arrived in was um, this world of Marcus Aurelius in the second century. Now, the reason I make so much of this is that if you've seen the movie Gladiator, uh, the uh, emperor in Gladiator, uh, played by Richard Harris, is Marcus Aurelius. Um, and the wicked son, um, played by Joachim Felix, is uh, Marcus Aurelius' son, Commodus, who was a bit of a madman. I'll talk about that later. Um, and, and all of the things are in, in all the scenes in Gladiator are very realistic, and there's quite a lot of accurate history there as well. So this is the world in which uh, Galen arrived. Um, it was the so-called golden age of the Roman Empire. There had been five good emperors between 96 and 180, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, and Antoninus Pius, and then Marcus Aurelius. Uh, and Marcus Aurelius is the prominent figure in the story with Galen, because Galen became the physician or one of the physicians to Marcus Aurelius. Now, Marcus Aurelius is um, uh, so important because he was a philosopher. He was a Stoic philosopher, and he wrote this famous book called The Meditations of the Emperor. Um, and the other interesting thing is that it was written in Greek. Of course, he was the Roman emperor, but Roman, uh, uh, well-educated uh, Roman uh, people of the elite uh, could all speak Greek. Many, if not most of them, had been to Athens to study with Greek philosophers. It was part of a gentleman's education. Uh, and early in his life, Marcus Aurelius had traveled to um, Athens. He was taught by a particular Aristotelian philosopher that I'll talk about a bit later. He became under the influence of the Stoics, and he wrote the, um, the uh, meditations. Um, the, um, his son, unfortunately, was a real uh, crazy man. This is Commodus, who was um, portrayed very well in the movie. Um, and Commodus, um, first of all, he kind of had the idea that he was uh, the reincarnation of Hercules. Um, and here's a statue of him with the lion head that Hercules was supposed to uh, use to have draped around his neck. The other thing about Commodus was that he was fascinated by gladiators, and uh, he would commonly go down into the gladiatorial ring and have fights with the gladiators, with some of the gladiators. Of course, it was all staged, and so he never lost. Um, but um, this picture down here shows him marching at the head of a group of gladiators. Anyway, um, he, his um, activities became so um, outrageous that he was, Commodus was eventually assassinated. So uh, Galen came to Rome and he rented a, a house, he tells us all about the house that he rented, and uh, he set about um, forming a reputation, building a reputation. And um, he did that by producing a series of public demonstrations. Um, and there were demonstrations really of his anatomical skill and knowledge. As I've said before, he was very well trained in um, Alexandria and elsewhere. He had a very extensive practical experience uh, as the surgeon to the gladiatorial school. And so really, would have been 
the foremost anatomist uh, and dissector in uh, that period. So here he is um, dissecting a monkey, uh, an ape. He also dissected pigs um, because there was an embargo against human dissection in Rome at the time. And these demonstrations were performed in this area here, which is called the Temple of Peace. And the, this is the remains in Rome, which you again can, can visit. Uh, the Temple of Peace was uh, kind of an academic uh, gathering area where philosophers met and gave lectures and uh, uh, discussed issues. And it was the place to be and to be seen if you were a rising intellectual, and that's where Galen did all his uh, demonstrations. And the idea, of course, was to gain patronage. If you're going to build a successful practice in Rome, you had to have good patrons. Um, and uh, at the same time, he began his writings. Well, uh, Rome um, at the time was a very competitive market. Of course, it was the center of the world, and there was a lot of money to be made. Uh, in medicine and elsewhere. And there were a variety of competing sects. Um, and here are some of the main ones. Uh, the dogmatists were a group that uh, followed the teachings of Aristoteus, uh, who was an earlier physician who believed that uh, the arteries uh, contain air. The arteries do not contain blood, according to the Aristoteans. And the pneumatists uh, were a somewhat similar group who believed that the arteries contained only pneuma, which I'll talk about a bit later, not blood. Uh, the empirics were a group that uh, had their origins in the skeptic philosophy. Uh, and they did not believe that you really could have any concrete knowledge about the human body. And so they relied totally on observation and experience. Uh, of individual cases rather than any overlying or overarching theory. And finally, there were the Methodists uh, who were uh, an unusual group. Uh, they had a philosophy that stated that uh, the body was composed of atoms. There were atomists uh, and the atoms circulated through the body uh, through various pores and illness was caused by relaxation or constriction of these pores. Uh, anyway, Galen um, looked at them all and provided a synthesis, a, his own synthesis of all of these philosophies. Uh, and that is the, uh, the basis of what he, he did and what I'm going to be talking about. He particularly disliked the Methodists um, because the Methodists uh, had a very simplistic view and they said you could learn medicine in six months, which of course really upset Galen, who was... Um, uh, somewhat of an obsessional character. Well, now this is a picture <clears throat> I'm going to spend a wee bit of time on because it's really interesting. Uh, as I've said, it's it's the blow up of uh, an engraving. I think it's probably a woodcut um, from the front page of the collected uh, Galen of uh, I think 1520. Uh, but it uh, tells us a number of things. First of all, it shows a very famous experiment that Galen describes uh, him performing, and it's called the squealing pig experiment. Um, over here is a drawing of the nerve supply of the larynx, the voice box. And one of the major nerves is called the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which has got a very unusual course. This is the vagus nerve, and then a branch of this vagus nerve passes under the aortic arch and then back up the neck uh, as this recurrent laryngeal nerve. It's a very unusual nerve and quite difficult to find um, even for uh, you know, a modern anatomist. Anyway, Galen's party piece was that he had a live pig, which of course was struggling and squealing. Then he'd dissect down onto the recurrent laryngeal nerve and cut it, whereupon the pig stopped squealing miraculously, and this was Galen's party piece, and this is what it's describing. But the other interesting thing about this picture is that it's showing um, a lot of individuals who are really important for Galen's story. Uh, and I've written a list of them down here just to sort of jog my memory. 
uh, as to who they all are. Um, the first one here is Eudemus. Now, Eudemus was an Aristotelian philosopher, and many of these are philosophers, you'll see, um, because there was uh, an intermixture of philosophy and philosophers, as well as people of science and learning uh, and, and medicine. It was, there wasn't a dis discrete distinction. Anyway, uh, when Galen first came to Rome, he became friendly with Eudemus, the philosopher, who fell sick. And Galen was invited to treat him, along with two other characters, this fellow here called Marcianus, and this fellow over here called Antigenes. And Galen uh, fell out with these other two, said that they were uh, ignorant and didn't know what they were doing, and that Galen would fix Eudemus. And so they became his implacable enemies. Anyway, they're all watching. So this is Marcianus, who was um, actually an Aristotelian, uh, Erisistratean, one of these people that believed that the arteries only contain uh, air or pneuma. Um, the next one along is uh, this one here, Claudius Severus. And Claudius Severus was a Roman consul, a member of the Senate, a very important uh, member of the Senate. And he was also a, a great Aristotelian philosophy enthusiast. And he also was important because he married Marcus Aurelius's daughter, Annia. And the next one along is this one here, Lucius Sergius Paulus. Now he also was a consul at an earlier time. And a bit later after this picture, he became consul again in 168. Um, and he was also the prefect of Rome. Next one along, this one here, Flavius Boethius. Now he's a really interesting character because he was a senator, a very influential man. And he later, shortly after this became governor of Syria um, but he was um, uh, very enthralled with Galen's work and his teaching. And Galen, in fact, treated Boethius' wife for a gynecological problem that he describes in his work. Um, and uh, um, Boethius persuaded Galen to um, dedicate uh, three of his books, uh, and they're the most important of his books, one of them called On the Usefulness of the Parts, the next one is uh, On Anatomical Procedures, and the next one called On the Doctrines of Hippocrates and Plato. And these three books of Galen he dedicated to Boethius. Next one along here is uh, Marcus Barbarus, and uh, he was uh, another Roman senator, very influential man. He was the uncle of the junior um, uh, emperor called Lucius Verus, who was for a time co-emperor with Marcus Aurelius. Then over here, we've got Demetrius. Um, now he was also a physician of Marcus Aurelius and he died in 168 and Galen took his place as uh, a royal physician. And here is Adrianus of Tyre. Now he was a sophist philosopher and um, he was invited to Rome by Marcus Aurelius. So when Marcus Aurelius went to Athens for his uh, education and philosophy and Greek philosophy. He was taught by Adrianus and he was so impressed by him that he invited him back to Rome to be a part of his entourage. And this one here is Alexander of Damascus, another Aristotelian philosopher who was actually the organizer of this uh, demonstration. And here he's being, um, you know, um, exhorted to uh, not take any notice of what's going by Antigenes, uh, and as I said, Antigenes and Marcianus were enemies of Galen. They were rival uh, philosoph uh, med uh, medics. Um, and Galen tells us that they uh, both accused Galen of magic, uh, which was a very serious offense in Rome at the time like that. Well, uh, <clears throat> at about this time, a plague uh, hit Rome. Uh, and uh, the Roman Empire called the Antonine Plague. It um, lasted from 165 to 180. It was also called the Plague of Galen. Um, and the reason it's called the Plague of Galen by later authors is that Galen gave the uh, first very accurate description of it. And um, he describes uh, black ulcerated uh, pustules all over the body, not enlargement of lymph nodes, 
but there was ulceration of the larynx and ulceration of the trachea and the esophagus, black diarrhea, cough, fever. Uh, all in all, um, most people think this was smallpox, but it could have been uh, something else. Whatever it was, it was not the bubonic plague. Um, and this is a picture of it uh, here. Now, the, <clears throat> this Galen's description was rendered into Latin by a later English author called Thomas Lineker that I'll mention again a bit later. Uh, and it was included in this volume here called uh, De Morbus Curandus. And up the top, you, you'll see in the engraving, there's a man with uh, these spots all over his head. Uh, here is being treated by Christ. Um, but this, uh, this is where this description of what I think was smallpox uh, was given. And this um, picture, I think, is meant to represent that. Uh, this is another frontispiece uh, from a, from a uh, 15, 1530 um, edition of uh, De Morbus Curandus. Here's Galen, there's Hippocrates. Galen was a great um, follower of Hippocrates. Hippocrates was a godlike figure for Galen. These are two compilers of Galen later, Paul of Aegina and uh, this is Orobasius. Well, uh, when um, the plague struck, Galen uh, took off <clears throat> and he went back to uh, Pergamon. I think I've just gotten a bit ahead of myself. So he left Rome in 168 because of the plague um, and went back to uh, Pergamon. But he was very quickly recalled the following year by Marcus Aurelius in 169. Uh, so he was uh, forced to come back to Rome. Uh, first of all, he went to the north of Italy to Aquilegia where the Roman legions were gathering. Uh, you'll remember that in the movie uh, called Gladiator, Marcus Aurelius uh, and uh, the general were fighting against the German tribes in, uh, on the Rhine. These uh, were, were called the Marcomanni. That was the main tribe that they were described, that they were fighting. Uh, and when they had finished uh, defeating the Marcomanni, the legions then came down, crossed the Alps into Italy, and they gathered in Aquilegia. Uh, in the north of Italy, and that's where the plague broke out. The troops probably brought the plague back uh, with them. Anyway, it spread very widely through, um, through uh, Italy. And um, Galen was uh, then assigned to be the physician to the young Commodus, who was Marcus Aurelius's son, uh, and um, he was eight years old at the time. But overall, you see through his career, uh, Galen was physician to Marcus Aurelius, to Commodus, his son. And then when they died to uh, Septimus Severus, and he was also a physician to Caracalla. And uh, all the time he was enhancing his reputation as a scholar and a philosopher. Um, and um, this is another engraving here from the top of this picture, uh, showing one of Galen's big breaks uh, Gale, um, Marcus Aurelius developed abdominal pain, which uh, Galen successfully diagnosed as colic from overeating. Uh, and this is a, a picture that's supposed to represent that Marcus Aurelius uh, rolling around with the colic from eating too much. And Galen has given the correct diagnosis. This is Galen here. Uh, and, but of course, here are the royal, other royal physicians who Galen um, accuses of being incompetent and not knowing what's going on. Well, all this time, Galen was uh, producing a, a very large amount of written work in books. Uh, and he wrote all in Greek. Uh, of course, uh, he was Greek, but no doubt he could speak Latin, um, but he wrote nothing at all in Latin. It was all in Greek. And um, the, the, there are 300 titles that are actually known, but uh, scholars believe that there were uh, many more uh, that were now lost. Uh, there was a great fire in 191 and um, many of Galen's texts were lost at that time. 150 or so of them uh, are known to survive either in parts or whole. And then there's ongoing dispute as to 
which ones are authentic and which are not. Anyway, a very large number of the works survive, but they are only a fragment of what is thought to have originally existed. And they cover a very large range of uh, things, commentaries on other physicians. And the importance of these is that Galen's writings uh, are often the only evidence that we have of the opinions of earlier uh, scientists and uh, philosophers and medical writers whose works are now lost. And so that's the importance of those. So he wrote on all these things, physiology, psychiatry, pharmacy, treatment, hygiene, and nutrition. And importantly, he wrote several books on, on philosophy, which I'll talk about a wee bit later. Anyway, all of the uh, work of uh, Galen uh, was collected together in Latin translation in 1821, between 1821 and 1833 by a German scholar called Kuhn uh, in 22 volumes, which uh, we actually have in the University of Otago Library, the medical library. Uh, there is the Latin text with German translation. Well, the physical theories that uh, Galen uh, believed in, he um, inherited from earlier writers. Um, first of all, um, he was uh, an enthusiastic follower of the writings and teachings of Hippocrates. And Hippocrates' name comes up all the time uh, throughout Galen's work. Um, he also, of course, studied Plato and Aristotle and makes a lot of reference to the work of Plato and Aristotle. Uh, he did not like the Epicureans or the Stoics. Uh, and Marcus Aurelius, of course, unfortunately, was a Stoic, Stoic philosopher. Well, um, at the time, um, uh, there was um, uh, a theory of humours, which um, was the fundamental uh, basis of all medical theory and treatment. Um, and this was based on the philosopher Empedocles' view that there were four basic elements in the world, earth, air, fire, and water. Hippocrates uh, added the four humours, which were the um, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood as the components of the human body. Uh, Aristotle added four qualities, saying that these humours and elements were either hot, dry, wet, or cold. And Galen's uh, contribution was to uh, mould all these together and uh, say that they were all related to the body temperaments, particularly that they were specific to individual organs. And this mixture of uh, humours, uh, the Greek word for mixture is krasis. Uh, and so from that we get dyscrasia, which means bad mixture. So when you say the patient got a certain kind of dyscrasia, what you, you're saying is this person's got a bad mixture. Anyway, the treatment for all this was basically food, baths, and massage. Um, now, this is a brief overview of Galen's practice, the kinds of things that he did. Uh, first of all, he um, would take a very detailed history, uh, and uh, this is following Hippocrates' uh, teaching. Uh, he believed that the most important thing was the history. In fact, Hippocrates was supposed to have said, if you listen to the patient long enough, they will tell you the diagnosis, which is kind of a nice a little uh, pithy saying to trot out to medical students. But it's quite true, actually. If you listen to the patient long enough, they'll tell you the diagnosis just from their symptoms. Anyway, um, this is Galen's practice. Um, and then he would study the patient's ability to produce a cure by themselves, what were the patient's natural powers? Uh, were they strong or weak? And how did they relate to each organ? Because uh, this is the basis upon which the physician was able to make a prognosis. Nature actually did the curing, but the physician provided a prognosis. So Hippocrates and his teaching was very important to Galen. Uh, urinoscopy, the uh, analysis of urine was also important, and also the pulse. Um, and this picture here 
uh, is again from that uh, front page that I showed you. And this is a story that Gallant tells in one of his books. Um, he was called to the wife of this man, Justus, uh, who, and the, the wife um, was very unwell. Uh, and when Galen took her pulse, he noticed that her pace, pulse started to race when she laid eyes on a very handsome young man who was a dancer called Pylades. And so this was the, um, the diagnosis of the lady's problem. It was a problem of love. Anyway, the pulse was very important to Galen. Um, now, he described... Um, uh, abnormalities of the body as either natural or non-natural. Uh, the natural abnormalities were things that were inherent in the body, problems in the body with the individual organs, which you couldn't do much about. But then there were the six non-naturals. They're the things that the physician could do something about. Air and environment, food and drink, sleep and wakefulness, motion and rest, evacuation, repletion, and passions of the mind. And these six non-naturals uh, were used in treatment uh, for the next 1500 years. It was an important part of the, the basis of treatment. All of this was managed by regimen, which basically is food, diet, and moderate exercise, not violent exercise. Um, now, bloodletting was known in um, the Roman world, and of course in the Greek world, Galen doesn't seem to be very fond of it. He does mention it, uh, but he didn't think it was a very important and very useful way of treatment. Well, from his uh, studies in Alexandria and studies of anatomy, and no doubt from his uh, great experience as surgeon to the gladiators, he uh, wrote several anatomy books. And um, it's really too detailed to uh, go over in, in particular, but I'll just outline the major uh, features of his anatomical discoveries. He dissected apes and pigs. Uh, in the spinal cord, he discovered the uh, effect of cutting the spinal cord at various levels. And so he experimentally cut the cord at various levels and demonstrated which parts of the body became paralyzed. And so he drew a diagram of spinal cord levels. He was the first person to do this. He described seven pairs of cranial nerves. We now know there are 12, but given the circumstances under which he was operating, uh, describing uh, the course and relations of seven pairs of cranial nerves is pretty good going. He differentiated motor and sensory nerves, which had not been distinguished before by previous writers. He identified the sympathetic nervous system or the outline that he described the sympathetic chain uh, and he described the major branches of the sympathetic chain. And with muscles, he described the effect of uh, agonists and antagonists, uh, pairs of muscles that oppose each other and muscle tone. And he wrote a book about that. Uh, incidentally, I've written the names of Galen's books in italics here, just so you can identify them. Uh, Motor Musculorum, one of, one of his well-known books. Now, in order to understand his philosophy, his, um, physiology, I need to digress a little bit, talk about the pneuma, which is the fundamental uh, spiritual entity throughout Greek philosophy uh, and in Galen's work. Now, from antiquity, the Greeks recognized that there was something that you breathed in that was important to life, and it was air. Uh, they also called it the pneuma, uh, it also was synonymous with the spirit and also synonymous with psuche, psyche. And if I just quickly go over some of the words, you'll recognize uh, many of them. Uh, air in Greek is air. That's the lower air as opposed to the aether, the ether, which is the upper air. Aether comes from the Greek word I find to burn. But the word artery means air terio, which means air carrier. And this comes from the idea that I mentioned before, a very ancient one in Greek philosophy, that the arteries only contain air, because when you cut the artery, it appears only to contain air, or appeared that way to the Greek. That's why it's called an artery to this day. Now, pneuma um, 
uh, means breath or spirit in Greek. Uh, and the Holy Spirit um, is pneuma hagion. And the study of um, the Holy Spirit and religious matters is therefore called pneumatology. Um, the Latin word spiritus means comes from spiro in the Latin, which means I blow. In Greek, to breathe is psukain. Uh, so from that is derived psyche or psuche. And anima in Latin comes from animos, the Greek uh, animos, which is breath. You'll see that the Latin words originally came from the Greek. Uh, and the Greek pneumo is the word for lung, uh, for when we get pneumonia, and the Latin word for lung is pulmon. So you see they're all related to uh, the idea of air uh, breathing some vital uh, entity called the pneuma uh, into the body, which in some way controls the mind or the psuche or life. If you substitute the word oxygen for pneuma, really you get the essence of it in Greek physiology. Now this is Galen's uh, physiology. He, he worked out um, uh, what he believed was the way in which the circulatory system worked. And this is a simplified version of it. He said that there were three main centers in the body, the brain, the heart, and the liver. And the liver was the center of natural spirits, the heart, the center of vital spirits, and the brain for animal spirits. So food and nutrient came into the liver where blood was made and it was imbued with the natural spirits, the spirit of life. And that was distributed around the body in the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava and provided nutrient to the body. A very small amount of that blood seeped through what Galen thought were pores in the interventricular septum. Uh, there are no pores, but he believed that they were, but some of them went into the left ventricle where they were imbued with a vital spirit of pneuma. Now the pneuma got in there by being inhaled in the lung and going into the pulmonary vein, going into the uh, left side of the heart. From the heart, this vital blood was then transferred to the brain where it was imbued with animal spirits which were then stored in the ventricles and they passed down into the nerves and throughout the body. The heart for Galen was not a pump. Uh, the pulse was caused by contraction and relaxation of the arterial wall. And he believed that he had satisfied himself about this experimentally, but he was mistaken, of course. Uh, so the pneuma is the essence of these parts of the uh, vital parts of the body, which together with the natural powers of the organs, uh, growth, attraction, retention, and elimination, which each individual organ have, is what was the essence of life. I might preempt this by saying that in Galen's view, the soul was basically the collection of these three groups of natural spirits. So Galen and the soul, we read a lot about the soul and psychiatry. Uh, now here's a picture um, from a 17th century artist uh, of a soul being taken up to heaven by two angels. And that was basically Plato's view and the view of ancient philosophers that um, all ancient uh, philosophy and medical theories were interested in, in the soul or the psuche. Uh, it was the source of uh, perception and motion. And the big question is, is it part of the body or not part of the body? And does it survive death? Well, Plato and Pythagoras believed that it uh, did survive death. It uh, went off uh, to uh, the ethereal realm. Aristotle and Galen, in fact, did believe that it did not uh, survive death. And Aristotle, in fact, thought that the soul was merely the form of the body for Aristotle. Uh, a body was matter plus form, and the form was the soul. <clears throat> so for Galen, the soul is actually just a temperament. Uh, it's a mixture, crasis, of the various bodily humors. And depending on the balance of the bodily humors, so the soul is affected. And he wrote a book here called The Soul's Behavior. Depends on bodily mixtures. 
uh, that's in a larger work here called Works Concerning the Philosophy of Plato. Um, he thought, therefore, that dreams were just an abnormal condition of the body, an imbalance of the humors. And so he used dreams for diagnosis and wrote a book about it, he wrote a book about everything that he decided to work on, and another book called On Affectations and Errors of the Soul. And the treatment for all of these problems was diet or the removal of the cause. Well, um, Galen, as I've tried to intimate, really was a philosopher uh, as well as a doctor, but um, he, this was common to all educated people of his time. So uh, he was not unusual in being a philosopher, but he wrote several books on philosophy, and these are some of them here. The Best Doctor is also a philosopher, that's the title of one of his books. The Value of Syllogisms, Mixed Premises, Similarity, and another book he wrote called An Exhortation to the Study of the Arts. So he believed that a, um, a training in philosophy was important for a practicing doctor, if only to teach the doctor the value of logic um, in making a diagnosis. Well, let me just uh, say a little bit now about what happened to Galen's writings uh, after he died and the transmission, um, which occurred, of course, all the way down to the present day. Um, in order to um, set the scene, I need to talk about the uh, fate of the Roman Empire. By the second century, the Roman Empire was very large. And it was clear that it was becoming unmanageable. Uh, not only that, but there were constant inroads being made by basically Germanic tribes, uh, hammering at the door, seeking uh, more uh, living space. And so the uh, empire's resources were stretched, uh, providing legions to defend themselves against the invading uh, Germanic tribes as in the movie um, Gladiator, where Marcus Aurelius is up here fighting the Marcomanni. Uh, anyway, um, Constantine and one of his predecessors decided to split the Roman Empire into two, into a Western Roman Empire with the capital in Rome and an Eastern Roman Empire with a center in Constantinople. And Constantinople was a city that Constantine created. So there was a division of the Roman Empire uh, in around uh, 350 uh, into a Western Empire. And the Western Empire gradually declined, and with it, the knowledge of Galen's work, and in fact, all academic work, because it, the Western Empire was basically overrun by the uh, Germanic tribes, the Vandals, the Goths, uh, and the others. Rome was sacked in 410 by um, by uh, Alaric the Goth, and then it was sacked again in, in 480 and 490 uh, by others. But the Eastern Empire survived and flourished as the Byzantine Empire. Well, Galen's very large uh, literary output was uh, compacted together and compiled by three well-known compilers, Orobasius, Aetius of Amida, and Paul of Aegina, from 350 to 650, uh, basically all in the Greek world. Most of them were based in Constantinople. As I've said, the knowledge of all academic things in the Western Roman Empire just, just withered away, it was overtaken by other tribes. But Constantinople was a, a vigorous um, center of learning. Um, the next thing that happened was the rise of the Islamic world with the the death of Muhammad in 632. Uh, shortly after that, the um, Islamic world and the uh, faith of Islam um, just uh, erupted into a vast empire over a very short period of time. A new capital was created in Baghdad and the uh, capital uh, and the Islamic world spread to Cairo all the way to, across to North Africa to Tunisia which was called Ifriqiya at the time, that's the origin of the word Africa, uh, Arabic word. And to the Western uh, part of what is now Spain as the um, called Al Andalus, uh, Andalusia. So there was a, a Western and an Eastern Islamic empire. And in order to uh, 
uh, um, control this vast empire, uh, the early rulers of the Islamic empire recognized that they had to uh, train uh, administrators and academics. And so in Baghdad, they set up a kind of a university translation house called the House of Wisdom around 800 uh, or so. And the, the early uh, Islamic rulers were very enthusiastic um, collectors of manuscripts and knowledge. They recognized that uh, they were a little behind uh, initially, but they were determined to catch up. And so they got um, manuscripts from any place that they could, brought them to Baghdad, translated all of the known uh, knowledge of the Greek and Roman world into Arabic and spread all the way through the Arabic empire. And we owe a great deal to the Islamic world for the preservation of um, Roman and Greek knowledge uh, as I've described. Well then, um, a focus really should go over here to Toledo. Now Toledo in the Western um, uh, Islamic empire, uh, so-called Andalusia or Al-Andalus, was a real melting pot of Jewish people, uh, Arabic people, uh, Greek speakers, and uh, some Latin speakers, but it became a great center of translation. So the Arabic works uh, that had been produced in Baghdad uh, were then translated from Arabic into Latin uh, in Toledo, including Galen's works. Uh, and the other center of this work was in Tunisia, from where it migrated across to the um, ancient or the early uh, medical school of Salerno. Uh, and so these translators were working from 800 to 1000 or so, first of all in Toledo. And uh, the standout figure in Salerno was this man here called Constantinus Africanus or Constantine the African. This is supposed to be a picture of him um, on the front page of an early um, manuscript from the Salernum, Salernitum Medical School. And um, uh, Constantine the African was a, a monk uh, who uh, spoke Arabic and also Greek and also Latin. And so he was a great translator of Galen's work from Arabic where they had come from Baghdad uh, into Latin, and he could also understand Greek. So from there, uh, from Salerno uh, and Toledo, uh, Greek, Galen's works then migrated to the developing universities. The universities of Europe were then developing between 1000 and 1300, Montpellier, Padua near uh, Venice, and the University of Paris, and eventually the University of Oxford by about 1200 or so. This is a picture of uh, uh, some students at the University of Bologna in uh, 1250. One of the students is asleep here, so it's not so surprising. So this is the way in which Galen's writings eventually ended up in Oxford and in the University of Paris and at these uh, universities. But there's one other important um, fact to add to all this. And um, in 1453, the... Uh, Constantinople was besieged by the uh, Islamic armies of Mehmet the Conqueror. This is Mehmet the Conqueror and Mehmet II. He was actually Turkish. By this time, by 1450, the Islamic world had been overtaken by the Turkish Empire, the uh, Ottoman Empire. And so uh, this was a Turk. But anyway, Constant Constantinople was besieged and the scholars remaining in Constantinople fled with their uh, Galen and other manuscripts of Aristotle and other Greek writers to the University of Padua. And uh, so it was to Padua that the early scholars migrated from Oxford and Paris to read these original uh, Greek works and the original Greek from Constantinople brought by the fleeing scholars. And a further link, uh, at least from the English point of view, is this man, Thomas Lineker. Um, now, Thomas Lineker was a scholar of Oxford. He was physician to Henry VII and Henry VIII. And as a young man, um, he was involved in this movement uh, of the 
mid 1400s called humanism, which was uh, a great interest in um, or developing interest in ancient medical, medical Greek uh, philosophy uh, and uh, medical writing. Uh, and um, this was the basis of uh, humanism. And so there was uh, a great uh, keenness to learn Greek language so that they could, these scholars could read uh, the works of Plato and Aristotle and Galen in the original Greek, because they felt that it had been largely corrupted by all the translation into Arabic and then into Latin by various people over 1500 years. So Thomas Lineker was a student in Oxford and uh, he uh, attempted to teach himself Greek, uh, not very successfully. So he went uh, off to the University of Padua. So we'll just go back here. So he took himself off to the University of Padua and was taught Greek by uh, three uh, scholars that were known to have come from, flow, fled from Constantinople in 1453 and were teaching in the University of Padua. And he learned Greek. Um, and then he uh, translated the Galen works from Greek into Latin. And uh, this is one of them. These are the names of the, he wrote, he, he translated six texts and they're the names of them in Latin. Uh, all uh, Thomas Lineker's translations. And um, so this is uh, perhaps the most well-known one called Methodus Medendi. And this is the one in which Galen described the uh, symptoms of the, uh, the plague of, of Galen or the Antonine Plague. It was called the Antonine Plague, if I just back up, because um, uh, Marcus Aurelius's full name was uh, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, and that's why he was part of the Antonine family, and that's why it was called the Antonine Plague. Um, but Thomas Lineker is a really important figure because in addition to being a physician to Henry VII and Henry VIII, uh, he founded almost single-handedly the Royal College of Physicians. Uh, he got a charter for uh, becoming a royal college from Henry VIII, uh, and that's another interesting story by itself. Well, Galenism uh, then fell into decline. Um, uh, the humanists, including Thomas Lineker, believed in the truth of Galen's works. Uh, he was mainly interested in translating them, but various uh, events began to undermine the knowledge of uh, uh, Galen's theory. And um, the first of them probably was this man called Paracelsus, a physician uh, from around 1500. And he developed a, a theory called iatrochemistry, the idea that the body is made up of chemical elements. Disorders of the body were due to imbalance of chemical elements and treatment was with chemical elements. And this is, of course, he fundamentally opposed to the ideas of Galenism. Uh, Paracelsus completely dismissed humors and Galen's theories. Uh, the next important figure is uh, Andreas Vesalius, uh, this man here. And in uh, 1543, uh, he wrote um, De Humani Corporis Fabrica on the fabric of the human body an important anatomical textbook where he pointed out various important mistakes in the anatomy of Galen, like the so-called uh, Galenic pores between the right and the left ventricle, he showed that they didn't exist. And the other important figure, not quite so well known, uh, is Santorius Santori. Um, and he was a fundamental uh, proponent of uh, yetra mechanism, which was the idea of measuring the body's functions. And here is a, a picture from uh, the front page of one of his textbooks, where he's sitting in a balance with food in front of him, and presumably a chamber pot underneath it, and he's got a balance. And basically, uh, he describes how over a complete 24 hour period, he described uh, measuring uh, what went in and what went out, and uh, so he wanted to calculate various things about the body. 
but he also uh, used uh, the thermometer that had been developed earlier, not so much earlier by Galileo. Uh, and Centaurus um, did a lot of mechanical measurements of the body. This, of course, was completely fundamentally opposed to uh, the ideas of Galen. So Galenism basically fell into decline. Well, what is the, the legacy of Galen? Um, certainly he was the, the, the sole medical author for 1500 years until uh, Vesalius and co um, undermined him. Uh, his literary output was absolutely vast, as I pointed out. Uh, and it was so vast, I suppose, that people thought that there was little left to be learnt. And in many ways, he was like Aristotle in this regard. Aristotle's output was very large. Also, his works were preserved by the Arabs, just like Galen. And just like Galen, Aristotle's uh, philosophy was really unchallenged for at least 1200 years from uh, the Roman period until maybe uh, 1300 or 1400. So there are some similarities between Aristotle and Galen's fate. Um, but getting back to Marcus Aurelius, uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, wrote in one of his works that Galen was the first among doctors and unique among philosophers. So these are actually um, Marcus Aurelius's words in one of his works. So his reputation in the Roman world uh, and subsequently was enormous. And when you go to visit uh, Pergamon or Bergama in the town square, you'll see the statue of Galen, um, which tells you a lot about him. Um, he's kind of nonchalant, uh, he's very self-assured, completely self-assured, here he's got his book, he's just sort of leaning casually against the <laughs> pillar, a very self-assured kind of individual, you'll see there's a, a Turkish delivery van in the background and the ubiquitous flags of Turkey that are everywhere in, when you travel around in Turkey. But here Galen is um, you know, very relaxed, uh, cocky, totally self-confident character. Um, and I'm sure Galen would have liked the statue. At least that's what I think. So thanks very much for your attention. And uh, I'll just um, stop sharing my thing. And there we are. Chris. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Terence. As ever, um, an extraordinary amount of information <laughs> that comes into your your talk. So I've um, allowed you all to unmute if you would like to ask a question uh, verbally. I've noticed that there are a couple of things in the chat. Um, so do I, do, I, do I look at the chat? Do I? If you, you, you could look at the chat and then you can just okay. uh, clear those so up. It was a bubonic plague. Okay, well, um, the Whatever it was, I think the Antonine Plague was not the bubonic plague, no. And the reason is that Galen gave a very good description of it. Um, oh, this is Petty. Hello, Petty. Um, the, um, yeah, he gave a description and it does not describe any bubos, no bubos. Um, and so for that reason, it was not the bubonic plague, I think. Um, were his texts held at Pergamon, Rome or Alexandria? Well, to my knowledge, um, he started writing in Pergamon, and then he took his writings with him to Rome. Um, and so they presumably existed in Rome, or well, they did exist in Rome, because he tells us that uh, he lost a lot of his texts in a major fire in the temple um, in 191. Uh, so um, it, it was mainly held in Rome, I think, but then I suppose it spread from Rome to Constantinople. It probably spread throughout the Roman Empire, um, but because the Western Roman Empire withered away, it was basically lost there, but it was preserved in Constantinople. Uh, the fire was in Rome. Yes, that's uh, Catherine. The, the, the uh, fire was in Rome. That's exactly right. It was um, in uh, the temple um, 
uh, let me see now, called the, um, what was it, the, uh, the Temple of Peace. The Temple of Peace was a forum in Rome where academics uh, all gathered together. And that's where Galen did his demonstrations. But uh, also it would appear that there were uh, warehouses uh, there, bookshops, where Galen apparently kept uh, many of his manuscripts. And he describes in one of his books how he lost a very large number of his own manuscripts in this fire in the Temple of Peace, in one of the bookshops there, presumably in 191. Uh, so that was certainly in Rome. Uh, okay. Uh, good. Okay. Catherine. Catherine. Uh, that's Catherine. Yeah, she's yep. coming. I'm coming. <laughs> yep. Hey, Catherine. Hello. Thank you for a great talk, Terry. It was really terrific. Really enjoyable way of finishing a quite busy Thursday for me. Um, I've got a question which I know you read a lot. So I, I, I read, and you might be able to answer this because I've always been curious about the influence of Galen on a much more modern figure, which is Arthur Conan Doyle, who, of course, was a doctor yeah. before he wrote Sherlock, well, you know, continued to be whilst he wrote Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Um, Galen, I've read an account of, written by Galen, of him going into, um, performing a home visit on a patient, and his observational methods of how he reached his conclusions and diagnoses, which reads incredibly similar to how Arthur Conan Doyle portrayed Sherlock Holmes. So I was just wondering, are you aware of any link? You know, this is really sort of, yeah, not exactly quite on piste uh, you know, to your talk, but I am curious, are you aware of any link between, you know, um, Arthur Conan Doyle being very familiar with Galen's works as an inspiration for Sherlock Holmes? Uh, Catherine, no, I'm not aware of it. I mean, I've never thought of that before. It would be, might be worth exploring. And though, of course, uh, Conan Doyle supposedly uh, modelled uh, Sherlock Holmes on one of Conan Doyle's own teachers in uh, the University of Edinburgh, uh, who was a very sharp diagnostician. Um, and, um, but I don't know of the relationship to, to Galen, but uh, that's a research project. <laughs> Yeah. We just have to find a medical student now to do it for us. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a summer project. Yeah. Another question? Okay. Oh, no, that's no, so smallpox. Um, up the top there, there's a um, from Paddy. Was it bubonic plague query smallpox? Well, um, I and a lot of other people think it was smallpox, mainly because of the Galen's description and also these black. Uh, pustules that were over the entire body. He describes pharyngitis, laryngitis, esophagitis, diarrhea, coughing, and fever, but no bubos, no lymph node enlargement. Um, of course, there are several other possibilities. It could have been something like an extraordinarily virulent kind of measles, even. Uh, some people I've read have even thought it was something like Ebola virus. So who knows? Um, but uh, smallpox is my best pick. Other questions? No? Oh, that's marvellous. Thank you very much again, Terence. Okay. Well, good night. And uh, uh, th for those people who are just hanging on, um, we are hoping that yeah. we will be in person for May. Yes. Can I just Wait, say we'll... something? Can I yes, just yes. say something? Yeah. So um, next month, um, as Chris has said, we should be in person, but we're going to um, record the talk on Zoom uh, and just like this and then put it on YouTube. So that will be in addition to the physical presentation. It's going to be on the um, Monroe collection in the uh, University of Otago uh, Library. Um, we've got a research student who's been working on the Monroe Collection, uh, which, and it should be a really, really interesting presentation. So I'd exhort you to either come along or, or, or zoom in. Yeah.